Good afternoon. Um, who of you is uh, using a computer for more than two hours on a single day? More than four hours? Okay, that's great. Um, is there anyone here in the room who heard the word life hacking before today? No, I don't know. Is, is life hacking huge here in South Africa? Not yet. It will be. I promise you that. Um, one disclaimer. I, my story is about uh, uh, technology. I, I, I have no idea about fin uh, finance, but a lot about tech. So this story will mostly be about what's happening in tech in the upcoming 10 years and how will that change uh, the dynamics of our society. I think it will be the end of the economy because I really think that the word economy doesn't describe what's happening right now. So we have to get rid of that word. Um, well, they're that influential, I think. <laughs> so this is what's happening when you try to get rid of a word here. Um, I will um, teach you something about life hacking first because I think digital skills are one of the most important things that, that, you, can, uh, that you can invest in. So whatever you want to invest in, first invest in your digital skills. On any single day, I get between two and 400 emails. At the end of the day, my inbox is almost empty every day. I'm a knowledge worker like you are, and I filter about 700, maybe 900 websites and weblogs on a single day. So the ability to juggle with snippets of information, ideas, and context is what knowledge work is, essentially, I think. Because as a knowledge worker, you juggle with these parts of information to solve problems, to create opportunities, or to go after really big challenges. And one of the most scarce things you have besides uh, uh, your family uh, and your kids maybe is your time. And I think knowledge workers uh, don't invest uh, enough time in their digital skills. Nowhere in boardrooms or in HR departments or at a government level, people focus on the impact of digital skills. And I think that's a pity because you need to invest in those skills if you really want to catch all the uh, opportunities of this age. And there will, I will demo them. So, Life hacking is about how to do more in less time, with less stress, at lower costs, with more impact. So how to harness the possibilities of the network and information age. I will give you a quick demo. Who of you is using LinkedIn? OK. Who of you uh, is uh, every now and then in a situation that you get invited on LinkedIn by someone that you don't know, but they also don't tell, uh, tell you what they want from you? So what do you do then? You ignore them. Who accepts everyone? Yeah, it's, it, it feels like weird. It's like, well, how do you deal with that? I get that about 30 times a day. It's the consequence of being on stage and stuff like that. So how to deal with that? Well, a life hacker thinks, hmm, can I automate it? So what I do if somebody called John invites me and I don't know him, I say, hi, John. Oh, let me see. Thanks for the invite. <laughs> And then I push the send button. Uh, I will change it into 30. So, and the next one is, hi, Petra. Hi, Evelina. Hi, Eric. <laughs> hi, oh, it's John again. <laughs> so I can do this about 30 times in only one and a half minutes. So I reply to everyone. You can test it. Um, well, to my findings, one third of the people never reply back. So great. That's a great filter. So I don't have to do anything with those, uh, those people. Uh, two thirds actually respond. Hi, Martin. Yeah, I, uh, I, I was at your lecture. I didn't really like it, but it wasn't polite to say it in public. So yeah, bye. Or I really loved your book or whatever. And then I say, oh, thank you. Maybe we'll pass across again. Ciao, Martin, or lots of love, or maybe uh, kind regards. It depends on the kind of relationship you have with someone. Um, is there, if, who of you encounters uh, every now and then the situation that you get a very long email with a lot of questions in it? Do they do that here? Well, if people try that with me, I respond very quickly. I will do this. And then I push send, and then I throw the email away. So when I go outside, I have a lot of unknown numbers in my phone. And I just phone them and say, hi, I think you had a very long email. What's in it? And then it saves time reading it. OK, and you had some questions. And then I just answer them, and then I hang up. Done. 
and there's no evidence. <laughs> you can always say, well, no, I think you misunderstood me. No, 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 sorry, I'm, you're wrong, I guess. So it gives you some slack, and it's, it's what you need nowadays, a little bit of slack. What's my point here? Well, I'm using a tiny program called Text Expander. It's on the Mac, but they have similar for the PC. It's only 15 euros. And if you, um, uh, if you uh, put it on your computer, it will calculate how much time you save. This tiny program saves me 40 hours yearly. 40 extra hours. I don't know what your hour tariff is or how many weeks holiday you have, but this gets you 40 uh, uh, hours extra in, uh, in a year. So in the Netherlands, we have 5 million knowledge workers. So if they all install this, we would save 200 million hours annually. That's 1 billion people, uh, 1 billion hours in five years' time we can save with something very simple like this. And as a life hacker, I use a few hundred of those strategies to get more done in less time with less stress at lower cost with more impact because I take my work as a knowledge worker pretty seriously. It's a pity that big organizations cannot deal with it because the IT department thought, well, to, save, uh, to secure 5% of the critical data uh, well, let's uh, secure 100% of the data so we cannot do our work anymore. So um, most of companies, you do, you're not allowed to download software on your own computer, so you cannot get any work done, I think. Uh, that's a pity. Why is that a pity and why is that so important? Well, we're entering um, a network and information age. I call it the new renaissance. A, a very interesting period in time where we have this confluence of all kinds of fields coming together. And the pace of change is, uh, is, um, is, is growing. The first guy who ever bought a fax machine couldn't do anything with it. If there's only one fax in the world, well, it's useless. So the second guy who bought a fax machine added value to the first guy, to the first fax machine, which is funny. I buy something, but after me, somebody else buys the same thing, and then my thing becomes more valuable. So the thousandth guy who bought a fax machine added value to the first 999 fax machines. It's the same with mobile. So Mr. Metcalf says, yes, um, every node that you add to a network increases quadratically the uh, total amount of uh, interconnectivity uh, possibilities here in this network. So a network becomes more strong and more dense as you add more nodes. It's called network effects. And I'm positive that everybody here in the room is very good at networking, otherwise you wouldn't be here, I guess. But network effects and network dynamics are rarely being studied. And I think they're the main cause of a lot of things that are happening right now in your field of work. Right now, we have 4G networks on our mobiles. But within a few years, in the Netherlands it's five years, we have 5G uh, uh, connectivity on our uh, cell phones. 5G is about 1,000 times faster than 4G. We have no idea what times 1,000 actually means. You cannot even imagine what happens when your car can go 10 times faster. So I think this will affect uh, organizations dramatically because there should be a normal uh, a connection between organizations and organizing stuff. But when you look at it carefully, organizing stuff is nothing more like, like puzzling, trying to get the pieces together. So I don't know how it's here, but in our country we have those, dust, uh, those, uh, those uh, trash bins on the street with a little sensor in it, and they are connected with a SIM card. And as soon as uh, it registers that it's full, it phones the, the truck and says, hi, I'm full, please empty me. So we used to uh, have organizations to do that, but we don't need organizations anymore with uh, technology like this. But technology that is 1,000 times faster will, I think, uh, eradicate a lot of big organizations because they're not needed anymore. They exist by, uh, by, uh, by the existence of supply-demand friction. And what I want to state here is that this friction is going away because of stuff like this. So it's the network age, but it's also the information age. And the information age is, um, is exploding. There's more and more information coming up every year. And a lot of people uh, have problems with um, something they call information overload. I don't know if it's common here. You don't have to worry, it's normal, information overload. But information overload only can exist uh, because of filter failure. You just never learned how to filter information, how to apply filters to your information streams, because nobody ever taught you that. 
it's nowhere in your digital skills list because you don't have a digital skills list. So every time um, um, a company is uh, hiring employees, they never ask them how good are you at filtering information. But I think uh, this can leverage your uh, capabilities as a knowledge work. Um, I encountered uh, this story on the web. Maybe you've heard of it. It's called uh, a DNA storage. And uh, are there any people here in the room who think that, uh, that you can secure data? Yeah, I, uh, yeah. at the moment you can secure data, but within 10 years I don't think uh, so anymore. So uh, what I read is that uh, at the moment experts and amateurs with a lot of budget and uh, totally without budget are storing information in DNA. DNA is the best solution so far from nature to store information, to copy it and to preserve it. Well, the funny thing is the capacity of one gram of DNA is like uh, half a million DVDs full of data times 7.9 gigabytes per DVD. It's like eight cubical meters of DVDs without a package, chunk full of data, and it fits in one gram of DNA. Here's the thing, you can make millions of copies with it via a biological process. Maybe you've seen Breaking Bad. So you can make millions of copies with it in only one hour. And it will, it will last for a few thousand years and it can uh, withstand uh, extreme heat and extreme cold. And at the moment, there are entire Shakespeare collections and House of Cards episodes and stuff like that already in DNA. They're playing with this. And you can look the guys up. You can say hi to them on uh, Facebook and LinkedIn and invite them over here to the university. This will be here. This is, science fiction is not uh, the future anymore. Science fiction is already yesterday. This is happening right under your nose. And a lot of this stuff is happening right under your nose. And if you really want to be in fintech, I think you should invest a lot of time in figuring out where is tech going. I just uh, got back from the biohacker summit. Biohacking is the field where biology and technology are conflagrating all together. And, uh, well, we have people there who do stuff like uh, this. Uh, uh, you talked about uh, uh, poverty here in Africa. Well, I don't think nutrition will be any problem anymore within 15 years worldwide because uh, Mark is one of the guys in the biohacking community and he grow his own first uh, hamburger. It's, uh, it's, uh, no animal died for it. It's not artificial meat. It's, uh, it, it's, really, uh, uh, it's real meat, uh, but uh, they, they grow the, uh, the cells. Uh, and a few years ago, this, was, uh, this first uh, uh, lab-grown hamburger was 100,000 uh, euros. At the moment, it's 25. That's a very big decrease in pricing. So within, I think, five years, this hamburger will be two euros, or maybe even less. You can grow meat. So if this happens, a part of your economy will collapse, especially the meat guys, but we can feed a lot of people. And this is what's happening here in this, uh, um, this was in the, uh, in the uh, newspaper today. Within five or 10 years, this will be on the market. So this is happening in the field of uh, biotechnology uh, uh, and biohacking. Um, and it was there that I learned that, that um, the storage capacity uh, 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 when it comes to DNA of a ladybug is 30 terabytes of data. So on those conferences, you meet people who are working on that. So, uh, so this is the new way of copying information. And every, time, <laughs> and every time they do this, they transfer 30 terabytes of data. Good luck with uh, security. Um, well, another interesting, this is Martijn, I've met him a few times. Uh, Martijn uh, implanted a chip under his skin. And in this hand, uh, he has actually two, uh, two uh, uh, chips, and so he can transfer money from the one hand to the other in his chips. So he actually got bitcoins in his hand installed. So it's like a digital handshake. And I think, oh, this is interesting. I want to have that as well. So this is a tattoo artist, because they're good at piercing stuff. Uh, and he's planting, a, I'm very nervous here, don't worry. But actually, it wasn't too hard. So I now have a, uh, a little chip here in my arm. Then I can store bitcoins. I can open doors. I can open, start my car with it. So RFID chips inside your body will be normal within 10 years. So you, most people think it's scary. But uh, well, it was nothing. You don't feel a lot about it. And another guy who, um, who has a chip like this is Peter Diamandis. And this is a very interesting guy. And Peter wrote the book called Abundance. Maybe you've heard about it. Is there anyone here in the room who read this book? 
Ah, thank you. Very well. Uh, abundance. Um, Peter is the founder of the Singularity University. It's the University of Google, Tesla, and NASA. Clever guys. And they are studying the impact, the social uh, uh, economic impact, of the confluence of exponential technologies. And this will change the entire game. And I think, especially for Africa, it's good news. I'm, I'm positive that within 30 years, Africa will be a more fun, nicer continent to live on than Europe. So all the refugees will get back and then establish a base here. Uh, why is that? Well, because of the confluence of all these technologies, uh, we will get into a world of abundance. And abundance is the opposite of the economy, because the economy is the study uh, that is uh, focusing on scarcity. But the opposite of scarcity, of course, is abundance. And, and Peter here in this book is stating that we slowly are, and now vastly, uh, are entering an age of uh, abundance. We saw it already, because everything that can become digital will become digital. We saw it with books, with music, with pictures, with videos, with 3D uh, drawings. And everything that is digital, you can copy, uh, make millions of copies of, uh, of it without any extra cost, which is leading to digital abundance. But there's something else coming up. Because of the confluence of all those exponential technologies that I will clarify in a few minutes, um, Peter is stating uh, that uh, around 2035, electricity will be free worldwide. Because the cost of uh, solar uh, power, solar cells, are decreasing very rapidly. Uh, within five years, you can print them yourself on a 3D printer that is more advanced and cheaper than there are now. And the efficiency is growing up. And, uh, and we're already solving the battery problem. So the predictions are that around 2035, worldwide, electricity will be free. That doesn't solve the energy problem because four-fifths of energy is warmth and cooling and dissipation, so the leaking of energy. But then we solved electricity worldwide. That's a game changer. Because then you can uh, use brackish water, salt water, or the rising sea level to, uh, to, trans uh, to transform it into fresh water. It costs money to, to turn brackish water into fresh water, but if, uh, if solar power becomes free, you can have fresh water for free. Now, that's fun for Africa, because if you have a lot of sun, and they have it over here, uh, you ha have abundance of fresh water. So you can get rid of the desert. You can grow plants, vegetation, grow food, and you also have nice weather. So this will be somewhere, somewhere the upcoming 20, 30 years happening here in Africa, but worldwide. This will change a lot of dynamics. There will be uh, more things happening because of this. So they study the confluence of uh, a lot of uh, new fields. It's biotechnology, uh, neurotechnology, nanotechnology, sensor technology, uh, uh, robotics, um, uh, photonica, deep learning, artificial intelligence, predictive intelligence, 3D printing, 4D printing, DNA sequencing, um, open source, open data, big data, open hardware, the maker movement, the do-it-yourself movement, and social swarms, Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn. All those fields are growing exponentially and are conflagrating. Why is that important? Well, the best solution in any field always comes from another field. We've seen that uh, happen before. And now we have 1.4 billion people on Facebook, 350 people, uh, million people on LinkedIn, and 300 million people on Twitter. So as soon as anyone finds out anything, they can like it, they can tweet it, they can blog it, and another one can jump on it and build upon that. There's also something called serendipity. Who of you is using those uh, yellow uh, uh, sticky notes? Yeah. So um, uh, th there was an accident. The guys at 3M were uh, trying to figure out a new glue, but this one didn't really stick and they throw it away. And there was another guy who said, oh, that's interesting, a clue that doesn't stick. Let's see what we can do with that. It was their biggest success. Uh, this is serendipity. So you're focusing on some fun, something, and you, you discover something that's not valuable to you that, uh, for that particular problem, but it's valuable anyway in a different field. And because of the web, we can uh, throw it in the world faster than ever. And the third one is, We've seen it before a lot of times in history that a group of experts, maybe academics, are trying to solve a problem, and there's a lunatic coming by, say, hi, what are you doing? Uh, get lost. Why don't you do it this and this way? Okay, are you serious? And then the guy was right. He was a lunatic, but he has a fresh opinion on the stuff. So um, 30 years ago, 
nothing, no big deal. But yeah, nowadays with the web, these idiots can post something online. You only need one guy who can see the value of that, and boom, everybody can jump on it. So this is happening right now under your nose, and I think it's the end of big organizations. Is there anyone here in the room who read this book on exponential organizations? Yeah, it should be, I think, here in this area. Um, this book jumped on uh, the last book, Abundance. It's from the same guys. One of them is Dutch, Yuri, and I'm pretty well. And exponential organizations is why new organizations are 10 times faster, better, and cheaper than yours, and what to do about it. And this is interesting, because this book came out only a year ago. It's one of the highest recommended books ever on Amazon. This is very special, because uh, Amazon is pretty big. So if you make it until this level of books, in only one year, you, you're doing something good. Mark my words, within half a year, the Pope and Bono will cite from this book because it's built on totally different management and organizational paradigms than ever before. And they're, they're building on those uh, exponential organizations. Um, but exponentiality is something that our minds cannot, get our, uh, 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 cannot deal with very well because we love linear. Who of you is very insecure? Who is so insecure that you pref prefer not to share with any other? <laughs> OK. Well, what I learned uh, from my journeys through the world, um, we as mankind, we are all insecure. And we're dealing with it. We're doing fine. We, 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 we pretend that we're not, or we, we're open, or whatever. But we're pretty insecure. And why is that? Well, we are the genetic end product, so far, <laughs> from everyone last 200,000 years who, uh, who was uh, uh, focusing on bad news, or eventually bad news. So if you were walking out of a cave 100,000 years ago, and you were walking there, and you thought, well, that's not a tiger, then those people be uh, got eaten, and they couldn't reproduce. So everybody who was keen on bad news survived and reproduced. So we are the genetic end product of people that are scared, because it saved us the last 200,000 years. But uh, because we're insecure, we love predictability especially in the world of banking, they love predictability. And, uh, well, um, that's not a good idea anymore. So linear, predict, you can predict. But exponentially, uh, you cannot predict. Exponentially is, uh, is starting very slowly, like here. And it's multiplying and multiplying, and suddenly it rises. You have no idea what you're looking at, and boom, as soon as you find out, it's too late. So this is exponentiality, and our minds cannot really deal with this. We saw it in the world of computers. In 10, 10 years' time, computers won't be 1,000 times faster than they are now. It's a million times faster. And we have no idea what a million times more computing power in the hands of 4 billion people on the planet actually will mean. But we see the first signs. We see it at Uber. Uber is not a taxi company. Uber is a data-driven, algorithm-driven, uh, algorithm, uh, 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 supply demand friction puzzler in the field of logistics and they will take over public transport because they're focusing on uh, 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 transport of food stuff and people and I think uh, 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 eventually they will uh, uh, transport people for free if we let them uh, uh, take uh, packages with them as well so they're the biggest competitor for DHL and, and, and companies like that so they, and they learn faster. They don't have assets. They, they, they have a lot of feedback loops. And they're, they're typically uh, an exponential organization. Um, Airbnb is something like that as well. Uh, I don't know. Who's used Air, Airbnb? Yeah. So it's an exponential organization. So one of the big things that are coming up right now is uh, extreme computing power. And I think this will be the end of the finance industry as we know it. Um, we saw IBM Watson. It's a, it's a nephew of Deep Blue. Deep Blue was the first computer that, uh, that won from the chess game uh, against Mr. Kasparov, the world champion at that time. And this is his uh, big brother called Watson. It's, uh, it has an API, so you can all play with it if you're technical. I'm not, by the way. And um, they let IBM Watson play against uh, the two best champions ever uh, on the American TV game uh, Jeopardy. It's a quiz, and they, he memorized the entire Wikipedia and computized all the semantics uh, within the Wikipedia links. And they let him play on, live on television against the two uh, best uh, uh, winners of the TV quiz Jeopardy. This quiz is pretty hard. It's not like how high is the Eiffel Tower or which country is beneath Canada. 
You have to actually understand the question to be able to, to answer. And of course, IBM Watson won the game. Big news for a computer scientist. I think he won because the computer can push a button faster than humans. Because we have this, yeah, well, this delay. So. But here's the thing. Within 10 years, this computer will be a million times faster than it is now. Freely available worldwide in the hands of more than 4 billion people on Earth via speech. Who of you owns an iPhone? Yeah. A lot of people who are using an iPhone didn't, uh, uh, didn't, uh, uh, aren't using this trick. That's shit. Zoek een foto van Martijn Aslander. Oh, it's not functioning. I need, of course, it's, it's when you demo technology. One more time. Oh. Zoek een foto van Martijn Aslander. Okay, it's 98% accurate. Voice will be 100% accurate within three years. So um, I'm talking to my phone all the time now. I think it's what they designed for uh, eventually he talking <laughs> to talk to. But uh, I, I, yeah. <laughs> but I, 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 I type on my phone less and less, even on my computer. And people say, isn't that awkward talking to a phone? I think, okay, now isn't it awkward to try to, to, to create letters by typing buttons on a screen? So I think speech will be there within a few years, and then we can just ask a question, and then the supercomputers will understand what you asked. So is there anyone here in the room who's focusing on uh, auditing in the world of finance? Yeah. So I think an audit is nothing like uh, 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 an algorithm with a strict set of rules because of legislation and compliance to figure out if your data set is, uh, is okay. So with algorithms like this and computing power like this, you do do and then in seconds, it will find everything that's not right because of the strict set of rules. So I don't see any future for a lot of accountants anymore. Uh, no. Well, actually, I, I want to take that further on. I think that the whole uh, essence of, uh, of accountancy will uh, uh, vanish because um, if, if financial data will be within 10 years real time, computized and uh, represented it in a form that you need at that particular moment to make sense, and you're absolutely sure that the data f is right and, f and fits, well, what do you need financial institutions for by then? So I think, uh, I think we can get rid of them within 10 years because of stuff like this. This, this is a base of what we already know. Uh, it's the same with big law firms, by the way. I think 70% of all the big companies uh, will, will die they're too slow, uh, too expensive, and they cannot innovate anymore, and they, they're not very keen on uh, digital skills. And uh, I think within 10 years, um, computers like this can memorize all the laws ever written, all the verdicts ever written, all the uh, media uh, uh, responses to all the verdicts ever, and they can computize that in, uh, in a matter of seconds for free. Because the big money at big law firms is not made by the partners uh, at the top, but uh, all the guys and girls uh, below in the organization who are trying to figure out all this information. And the computer will do it for free in seconds. So I think it's the end of organizations as we know it. So what to do with that? Well, here's an interesting guy, Seth Godin. I don't know if you know him. You should follow this guy. Uh, he says, when everyone has access to the same tools, um, Having a tool isn't much of an advantage. In the industrial age, the age of scarcity, a lot depended on the advantages uh, of owning uh, uh, tools that others didn't own. But that's not true anymore, because all the tools are virtual, and everybody has access. Uh, if you have an internet connection, you have access to anything you might need to produce, or to scale up, or scale down again. He says it's time for a new advantage. It might be your network and the connections that trust you, and that remains important. It might be your expertise. I so love the word might in this sentence. <laughs> oh, you're very good at something. Well, that's great. But most of all, he says, I'm betting it's your attitude. And I think he's right. I think in the network and information age, in this new renaissance, attitude is more important than expertise and network. Because with the right attitude, maybe you, heard this, uh, you know this sentence from the HR world, hire for attitude, train for skills. 
it doesn't matter what people can do. It doesn't matter if they have a diploma. If they're not too stupid and they have the right attitude, you can teach them anything. Because if they're hungry for new information and they want to learn, you can teach them everything. And I think we're slowly, no, fastly entering an age where people with the right attitude, with access to the web, focusing on the digital skills, can disrupt any field they want to. Because there are no barriers anymore to enter anything. You just work around it. So this is the field, I think, within you are competing with the entire finance system as we know it right now, and I think it's necessary. And I'm positive, uh, as a response to your story, um, that within five years, everyone on this continent has access to a smartphone, and that they will be offered for free, because the benefits that come with it from the guys giving it away are bigger than the cost. And then they're all bankable, but yeah, who needs a bank anymore if you can use the blockchain to create a new uh, coin like M-Pesa, but then better and faster for free? Because I think Bitcoin is faster than M-Pesa. So uh, I think it's good news for Africa, uh, but I'm a positive guy. I can talk for hours about this topic, but uh, let's not do that today. Um, I'm here every two months, something like that. So if you want to have a chat uh, uh, in the upcoming uh, uh, months, uh, it would be great. Um, when you go to my website, martijnaslander.nl, I have an English newsletter that is being published once per three months. And every new book that I encounter, every new insight I have will be in there, so you can sign up for free. And I think there's some time left for some questions. Uh, Graham, what's the plan? Yeah. Okay, thank you for listening. So, uh, again, I don't know anything about finance, but I understand tech, I think. And this is what I see, and it's not the truth. But I do think I have a point, and please take that point with you and think about it. Any questions?